Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Samira Tilly, Industry Marketing Manager at Assemble Systems, an Autodesk company. In today's webinar, we will look at how F.A. Wilhelm Construction is successfully tackling change orders with BIM and Assemble. Now let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Tim Kelly, Senior Product Manager at Assemble. Go ahead, Tim. Thanks, Samira. I appreciate that. Um, uh, to get started today, I'll go through kind of the organization. In our typical fashion, we're going to do some brief uh, introductions of our speakers. Um, and then we'll dive through uh, some company introductions. And then uh, the bulk of the content today will be focused on, as Samira mentioned, uh, organizing data for change orders and how F.A. Wilhelm has stepped through uh, that process with the symbol. Um, and then we're, we're going to allow some time for Q&A at the end, and hopefully you guys uh, can submit some questions that uh, will uh, encourage our conversation at the end, and, and we'll dive into a good, uh, rich Q&A session as we uh, like to do. <clears throat> so just a brief introduction of myself before I turn it over to Thomas. Um, as Samir mentioned, I'm the Senior Product Manager uh, with the Assemble Systems team. And um, in that role, I'm obviously listening and talking with uh, a number of you guys uh, on the call today of, of what uh, and where the Assemble product goes in the future. And um, a little bit about my past, I come from um, commercial construction. Um, that's with the general contractor that um, the, today's speaker and, and, and Thomas is uh, a, a great team member of mine for, for the duration of my career. Uh, we've both been a part of uh, a nationwide peer group of general contractors. Um, and so over the course of the last uh, about 10 years, we've had a, a number of different meetings on uh, what they're doing in their region and how they're leveraging BIM and what we were doing here in Texas. And, and so a great relationship and, and a, a you know, great company friend I'd like to introduce and, and uh, let Thomas talk a little bit about himself. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, my name is Thomas Jacoby. I work with uh, Wilhelm Construction here in Indianapolis. And, you know, as he mentioned, we're part of a national peer group and have visited uh, Houston a number of times trying to figure out how to actually use uh, Assemble and, and how we can sort of expand our, our pre-construction and a lot of our technical capabilities here. And I think we're, we're slowly figuring things out and trying to get the, the right ways to do everything that we're trying to do. Awesome. <clears throat> Not listed on the screen here, but uh, also uh, joining us today is Don Hendrick, president of Assemble. Uh, Don, can you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Sure. Kind of last but not least, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, my name, again, is Don Enrich. I'm the president of Assemble Systems here at Autodesk. And um, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our product and uh, then have uh, our customer, Thomas, talk us through a little bit of how they use it at FA Wilhelm. The product itself is a system of engagement. And what that really means is that since it's a cloud-based product, it is able to be used by anyone and connect to many other things very easily. We have an expression where we say, you don't need any special software, you don't need any special hardware, and you need very little training to take the assemble system and start to build value for your company. Uh, and the way that the Assemble works is we, we federate models uh, and uh, associated drawings and point clouds and organize the data uh, and also allow you to condition it. The superpower of Assemble is the ability to use the data, whether it's the object name, um, a coding system, a location, uh, or anything else uh, that is kind of construction management oriented to organize the data into unique views uh, and, or groups. And uh, you'll probably see a little bit of that today. But basically, by, by grouping, sorting, and filtering the, uh, the, the model with the associated metadata, we can create very powerful bundles of information. These are used for things like for bids uh, or bid packages. Um, you can uh, export these into your project management software. You can connect these up to Sage Estimating, to Excel, to Primavera P6, uh, and many other systems. And we are about to release our newest connection, which will be the BIM 360 Docs, for those of you who are Docs users. And now I'd like to turn it over to Thomas and uh, Tim 
to take us through their workflow at uh, FA Wilhelm. Thanks, Don. So as I kind of mentioned before, I work with uh, Wilhelm Construction in uh, our virtual engineering department, uh, or BIM, I guess, is, is what most people know it as. Uh, we've been around for about 95 years, largely focused in uh, Indiana and Midwest region, so within about uh, two to four hours of Indianapolis. Um, we're one of the largest uh, general contractors and construction managers within our region. Um, so we cover a lot of work, a lot of different industries, and get thrown a lot of problems pretty regularly. Some of the work that we, we do um, with pre-construction, construction management, general contracting, um, working in with industrial clients, with uh, as, a, as a trade contractor in steel, um, concrete, masonry, and, and do our, some of our own earthwork. So very versed in, in a lot of different things, which means that we've got a lot of challenges to make sure our projects run as well as we can and make sure that our budgets are actually correct. Uh, for all of our clients and as well as to make sure that our, our project managers are dealing with the the correct data as much as they can. So what I kind of wanted to get into um, is how does BIM and, and Assemble really help with the change order process? Not just necessarily in the field, but also a lot of those changes that happen in pre-construction as well. So you know, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to prevent, prevent those delays, uh, prevent re rework, make sure that we're actually making money at the end of the day, make sure that, that everyone on the team, uh, designers and owners included, really understands what actually is happening throughout the construction process and pre-construction process. So one of the first projects I wanted to talk about is a project I recently did uh, in South Bend, Indiana, just, just north of Indianapolis here. And what you're looking at is about 170,000 square foot casino and, uh, and a parking garage that got added onto that. And, and really what, what we try to push here a lot was uh, working with the design team throughout about a year and a half of pre-construction. And then we had 13 months to, to from break, breaking ground to actually the grand opening. And you can kind of see in there, there's, there's miles and miles of piping underground. Um, you know, electrical and plumbing and, and everything else you can think of that they decided to put in there and really trying to make sure that we understood what all was, was actually occurring on that project. So if you want to go to the next slide there, you can actually see the project at, at completion. This was about uh, about three days before it opened, what everything looked like. And you can see kind of the, the changes that we were dealing with. So what, what's highlighted in green there, they added a uh, about a 3,000 car garage a month after we broke ground. So we, we still had a 13 month schedule, but we had to deal with uh, an added change of an entire, basically another project onto this project. And, and this was really just a highlight for our team and to understand for everyone to really understand where those changes are happening. Um, and now, now you're actually looking at what the final product was uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and again, about three days before opening, so an empty parking lot then, but a, a very full parking lot just a few days later. And really helping our team to understand just all those minor changes and, and really where, you know, some of the, the different connections happened and where things really tied together in a very visual sense, but not only that they could see it, but they could actually see it live. So we could update those models on a regular basis and, and they could really understand what those minor changes were. So when the entire other project gets kind of tacked onto your project, you really can understand uh, what happened to the original, um, what those quantity changes are, how to verify those, uh, what, what changes are going to happen in the field, and, and what those quantities are as well. So, and, and really I'd just like to show this next picture um, mostly just to understand how crazy it was really underground and, and how much we had to sort of deal with that mostly because I spent uh, uh, quite a few months with an entire team of people trying to figure out what was really going on um, underground to make sure they could actually get built. Uh, but again, you know, without having the ability to upload all these models and, and work within Assemble to understand what those costs were so we could actually get to a, a final price and be able to get this thing out of the ground. Um, the next project that I wanted to sort of just kind of touch on, one where instead of being a pre-construction and general contractor, a construction manager, um, we were actually a general contractor on this, you know, hard bid project, 
but again, still a useful tool even during construction. This is actually from my alma mater where we're actually doing some work, Ball State uh, University. Um, this is the new health professions building they're looking at, and what you're seeing there is what it's going to look like and, and what it looks pretty close to uh, right now with the skin on and, and close to final completion, but uh, to click one more time there, uh, you'll see uh, what it really looks like underneath. Um, just how many systems are in there, uh, you know, what everyone, what we're all kind of used to seeing as, uh, as things are getting built and what a lot of us really have to care about quite a bit to make the building actually happen and, and really get built the correct way with as few as, uh, as few as change orders and as, as little rework as possible. But the project I really want to focus on, uh, if you click the next slide, is uh, the Mount Carmel uh, Health System. It's a, a brand new hospital addition that they worked on. We actually were the construction manager, or not the construction manager, the uh, uh, concrete trade contractor on it, working under a construction manager. Over 500,000 square feet, new construction. Uh, our contract alone was over 25 million, uh, 210 new rooms they added. The, the big things I want to highlight on here, though, are the, I think it was about 28 different ASI model updates that happened and over 200 structural RFIs, and those are only the ones that we really saw to the point where we had, had uh, finished and we were off the job. So uh, kind of a crazy project, a lot going on, a lot of stuff happening, and a lot to manage, especially in the field and, and making sure that our guys who were you know three hours away from our, our headquarters really could understand what's actually happening. So if you click the next slide, we can look at... Really quick before you jump to the next slide, and I, I've been kind of wanting to jump in and just mention something that's that's great about Wilhelm and, and, and the interaction that we've had in the past as part of the same peer group. Um, what I love about this problem solving it here is as, as Wilhelm or as the company I work for or any of the other, you know, many members of this peer group, all relatively... Uh, similar size contractors um, in, in different regions, different different spaces across the industry. Uh, when they face a problem like this, what's fantastic is each of the different groups uh, will say, hey, you know, we're looking at uh, this type of project and we're working through bid and and ultimately we're, we're in this situation um, looking, you know, some of these general details here. Um, here here's what we've got going on and um, let, let's let's try and work together and, and resolve this issue. What would you guys do? And and there's so much information sharing during that. It it it's a you know it, Thomas had, had gone through some of the uh, key points in pre-construction on one of his previous slides of of how kind of BIM helps in that aspect. But I think uh, the key point that I I took away from that is the collaboration uh, across the team. Well, I, I love to see and, and I love to be a part of the collaboration that was taking place across the industry where uh, we might uh, look at a problem a different way in, in Houston, Texas than they do in, in South Bend or in Mount Carmel, Indiana. And ultimately, we're collaborating and talking about how uh, we have different ways of resolving some of the same issues and, and kind of uh, feeding information back and forth. So um, I'll, I'll kind of let you dive back in and go to the next slide. I just wanted to interject and talk about uh, some of the really interesting things that uh, can take place across and, and working, you know, with, with peers across the industry. Right, and, and, and especially on this project, you know, we're working with a national contractor, you know, local contractors, and we were working about three hours away from our own office. So um, making sure we really have that, that collaboration and talking with the entire team and, and understanding what the construction manager needed from us, what we needed from the design team, uh, to make sure this process was as smooth and and to make sure everything could go as you know as smoothly as pro possible and we could actually maintain the timeline that they're looking for. The biggest thing for us was really to make sure that our uh, teams in the field really could understand what's actually happening and that without having to delay the process or delay the project, they could get a lot of these models and a lot of these change orders worked out in the field and not have to sit there and pull, pour through, you know, hundreds of new drawings that are being issued and figure out where those changes are and constantly be looking for anything that's got clouded or anything else. Um, so what you're, what you're looking at here is actually the, the assemble interface. And, you know, any one of our, our team members has access to this and 
what you're seeing is two different models we're looking at, which I believe is the 99% drawing set, basically 100%, and uh, what I believe is ASI 9. So, you know, not, not exactly the next immediate model, but really just to, to illustrate the changes that were really happening. Um, looking at all the quantity changes, you can see things getting added to the project, things get, that get deleted. I mean, it just was a constant change that was happening, and entire walls going away, different sections of the building completely changing. So really, this helps our, our teams in the field to be able to quickly look at something and say, okay, this is a no-cost change, or, you know, this is a major change, we need to sit down, we need a little more time to figure out what's actually happening. Or, you know, maybe it's the no-cost change, but this might affect the timeline because of something got shifted around or got moved. And one of the other things that we tried to do a little bit on this project, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to show it to you today, is here in the office we were able to actually kind of split up for them uh, the pore sequence and, and how things were going to come together so that they could look in the model and understand the quantities that they were actually ordering and, and how much was really happening throughout you know day-to-day -day basis uh, throughout that project. So highly visual, very easy to look at the report, very easy to pull those reports and export them out. Um, you can you know easily just click in there and hit export to Excel and they can you know expand any of that and add it into any of their reports for the construction managers or owners or even for our field other field teams just to understand what's what's happening in the project. What you're seeing is, is really just how many changes were happening throughout this, this project with, with 25 different, actually about 28 different ASIs that we saw. Um, and you can see entire sections of uh, you know, the building. And, and again, it, it's only concrete that we're looking at here, so a little bit more simplistic, but still a, a lot of changes on a, on a major project that we really were trying to navigate and understand. Uh, and really make sure that our costs that we helped to budget on the front end and, and end up getting us the job could still be maintained and, and we were making sure the owner and, and the construction manager understood what those changes really were. So, um, yeah, and, and to add to that, I, you, you hit it earlier, but it's about that transparency. Certainly looking at a model and the quantities aren't going to affect all of the conversations that happen when changes occur. and, and uh, affect the discussion on why the changes have occurred, whether it was owner-driven or field-driven or, <clears throat> you know, issues that you, you face as you step through that process. Um, but, but what I like to say in this case is it really adds another lens and enhances the conversation taking place. So when you're looking at, you know, clouded drawings and you say we changed this from, you know, the this material to this material, well, well, how much is that? What is affected overall across the project? Um, looking at one sheet, but that same change might affect 50 sheets or you know, 30 sheets, something like that. But, but what's going on here is you're enhancing that conversation as you're talking with your subcontractors, as you're talking with your owner, and everyone is on the, the kind of the same page as far as the, the scope and scale of, of what's occurring. And, and I really liked your you know, animation stepping through the various changes that occurred in, in ASIs or bulletins as you guys work through the project. Um, ultimately, it's really it, it's really nice to be able to see that evolution of uh, what's going on from a design perspective as you guys are building this thing. So, um, really excellent uh, use case around exactly showing and articulating what's uh, what's being asked of the construction team and, and what you guys were doing. Right, and and really helps tell the story of, you know, dealing with those changes and, and you know how much change really can happen on that project, just so everyone really understands what's what, what's occurring and and you know those minor changes or those minor decisions you think uh, that don't you don't think affect too much or you think you could really cut costs out of something might might really make a, a major impact down the road to other por other portions of the project. No, I was just saying, ab absolutely, you want to have that, again, part of that same conversation, and that's really where, you know, as, as you incorporate data into a symbol and it lives version to version as you get those changes come in, um, it, it's certainly important to influence, um, you know, the data you're inputting in the model based on uh, what's coming down the pipe and, and how that interacts with uh, the, the changes that are occurring. 
Yeah, and one of the other things that we really loved, especially on this project, um, the ability just to, and you know, it's a small feature, but it's, it's a big feature, I guess, uh, in, in just the visualization of this, to be able to quickly categorize material type or uh, different properties within the model so that, you know, in this, what we're looking at is highlighting different walls so we understood the, the types of concrete that had to be, go in or formwork we needed to use, um, different decks, different materials coming in and out, just a highly visual way to be able to show our field teams, you know, all the way down to the foreman level to say, this is what's happening, this is what's coming next. You know, we really understand how the building needs to come together at the end of the day uh, instead of just staring at some, you know, 2D plan sheets where, you know, yeah, there's some notes and yes, it says everything and, and sure everyone can, can read them, but really to understand what's going to happen on the project and just how much, uh, you know, of a project there is there. One of the other things that, that we've spent a lot of time with is, um, this is actually another hospital, but uh, we're actually the construction manager on this particular one. We've spent almost two years from conception to, well, it's about a year from conception to breaking ground, and it's been almost two years to date uh, as we're just starting to get things um, in the air so that to actually uh, grow this project. but. You know, before we were looking at one where there's a single model that we're just looking at a couple changes on, relatively easy to tell, but in this case, it's, it's a very fast-paced project, a whole lot of, of different items going on, and we've got almost 19 models to deal with and, and about 10 different design teams. So multiple buildings technically separated out, uh, multiple systems, and, and being able to manage that process from day one with the design team collaboratively to understand when major changes happen, when a new design partner comes on, uh, when major structural changes happen or facade changes or um, really just anything, we're able to look without you know, much needed time to really understand what's happening in that project. You know, with 19 models, it means I'm looking at a whole lot of different things that I can see changes on. Um, I can see changes between designers. I can see changes between uh, buildings and systems and really try to get to that granular level to understand what's, what's happening in the building. If, if it's drawn yet or not, um, if it's detailed, and, and understand what needs to come next. So when the owner's concerned about how many lights are in the building, we can tell them it's exactly you know this number of lights versus, okay, give us two weeks to sit down and pour through some drawings and we'll find them all. Um, so it's, it's a lot faster turnaround. Yeah, I, I've definitely uh, I've, I've participated in some of this conversation with owners before, where um, you know they want to make those changes or influence the the, the design and in this capacity. And having that interaction, where you you've got it organized here pretty well by uh, assembly codes, by uh, uniformat, um, and and being able to quickly filter down, look at just you know you mentioned the lights, uh, look at just those, quantify them, break them out, and color code by. Uh, the various types of lights you have and various levels that those things exist on or uh, which spaces in the building they're supporting. Um, that, that dynamic nature of moving data around is, is personally what I love about Assemble, the, you know, the ad hoc ability to, to manipulate data and incorporate their comments and their conversation into um, uh, the, the overall data set. Is, is is so meaningful to, to drive a, you know interaction with the designer um, in that sort of uh, that sort of way that sort of conversation that's taking place right and, and it's been very helpful on our end to really be able to you know dive into those details and kind of track that cost throughout the project so you know when we know we've budgeted X number of dollars, on one line item, we can see if the design team has actually drawn all those and caught up to that, or uh, you know if we've gone over budget on, in some area, um, you know if we need to be moving dollars around to, to help the owner understand what's really happening through you know this entire this entire process. But it is very helpful to to explain you know especially with our precon team that we don't necessarily have to dedicate twenty people just to look at this continuously you can have one or two 
be able to dive in and quickly find information um, when you need to and when you need to on a, on a you know quick turnaround basis as well as when you need to dive a little deeper and let get the entire team on to get a real real price at the end of the day to, to actually get the estimate out and get a, uh, a GMP or, or whatever else um, needs to happen. So real quick, and, and I, I, if you're going to jump to the next slide, I'm going to steal your show for a second. Uh, you're fine. You do. Yeah, so just just um, <laughs> break, breaking it up, and uh, I, I think this is probably a little bit of a commercial on Assemble, but uh, talk about a, little, a new feature we've recently added. Um, so in, in Thomas's screenshot here, he has uh, grouped by assembly code levels. And uh, within Assemble, since uh, the very beginning, we've had what we uh, incorporate is the assembly code uh, hierarchy. So you have, you know, level one, in this case, a substructure, um, at level two, three, four, and five. Um, so I get down to this level, and all, all Thomas has done is incorporated this code into some objects. Um, and it's intelligent to know that that's part of this grouping, that's part of this grouping, that, that all the way up. Um, so it knows that hierarchy and where it belongs. Um, in the past, we only had assembly code, and that was one grouping structure. Um, so you can obviously group by other properties, but we didn't incorporate other hierarchies uh, the way we do with assembly codes. Well, um, just recently we created what we call data trees, and you can incorporate as many data trees as you want. And again, in, in those different data trees, you incorporate a, a, a tree structure of uh, what you want that grouping to look like or what you want that data to look like. Um, so I, I can have it at level five and then roll it up to level three to level one. Um, and I can have as many of those as I want. So I can incorporate a uniformat and a master format and a work breakdown structure and a location breakdown structure all in the same project and then leverage um, uh, the various codings to group the way I want to see that information. Uh, so commercial over, Thomas. Go ahead and jump back in. <laughs> no, you're fine. I mean, that's that's uh, it's it, that's big for for everybody. I mean, especially for us to to really be able to, you know, break it down into the structure that we use to be able to estimate uh, and to be able to understand what you know what what the line items really mean. So when you're at a very high level early on, down to you know a much more detailed level uh, in construction. I mean, those hierarchies really do matter, and being able to, you know, kind of condition parts of the model uh, within Assemble to make sure that we can see it the way we need to see it, uh, or and or you know, someone else, maybe the owner or uh, or another partner, needs to understand some of the data. It is it is key and is a, a major feature, and, and one of the things we really do love about using Assemble. So, I mean, if you want to click the next one, I'm really just kind of showing some of the changes that happened throughout this project. And you can really, and again, I'm kind of only looking at the structure here, and you can sort of click through these, but, you know, mostly just for simplicity's sake that just so you can see a little bit more, you know, how much the process changes and, and how many things that you've got to look at and understand to make sure that, that we're providing the right numbers to the owner and, uh, you know, to ourselves to make sure that we actually have the right number at the end of the day. You know, it's key to make sure that we really have good data and something that we can really use to provide the right story to prove that uh, you know our numbers are correct and that the timeline is correct and uh, that this building can actually come together the way it needs to. Yeah, and, and, and just on this really quick, one of the things that uh, I like to point out here in, in the way you're incorporating data to this evolving design um, is, you know, as we step through those different changes, you're seeing a lot of wholesale changes. Like you mentioned, that that design is evolving, and and oftentimes you're not going to be, you know, in a in a typical or traditional CM at risk project, you wouldn't be updating your budget numbers as frequently just based on looking at the drawings because those things are changing uh, so much that you would wait until um, you know a major issuance. Um, from that you know, design set to come out, do your overall 2D takeoff, and then incorporate that into your updated budget number. Um, in this case, you get uh, across that kind of those wholesale changes, um, the, the broad sweeping changes that are occurring from you know the footprint of the building uh, changing and evolving. Um, and in this case, you can see lots of things that were added. You know this. 
uh, brand new edition of uh, um, uh, you know covering roof accessories and uh, maybe something changed in the flooring or something changed in the footings. Um, you can aggregate those, like you said, into kind of an overall spreadsheet that you're you're dumping out into your uh, kind of budget management process. And so uh, we see a number of our customers that are uh, leveraging this change management process to uh, you know trend things in design and ultimately track cost changes uh, on a weekly basis. Um, so because you get that detailed information so quickly, it's easy to incorporate uh, those those broader changes much more frequently. Yeah, and it has been a, a huge help on our end to really be able to quickly, you know, understand what's happening. You know, when you're talking with the design teams and you're in meetings to, to understand that, you know, those big changes can mean something and you know, did we capture that earlier or did we capture something that was in discussion that just now got designed uh, or actually shown in a model? Um, it's been, you know, huge to be able to see that, you know, across all projects that we're able to uh, work through this process and, and get everybody on assemble and to understand what's really happening there. Awesome. Now, now before we wrap up, Thomas, I have a, just a couple of questions for you. I just kind of, uh, really quick to set the stage again. You, you've been a user of Assemble for approximately how long? Uh, we've been using it for, I want to say, about three years now. Okay, perfect. So o over the course of the three years, I know kind of from um, our interaction, you're, you're uh, the primary driver of getting the data into the system and organizing it in a way that gives you the ability to do just this with the overall project management team, with the overall pre-con team. Um, what what would you say if if you were to give some kind of tips from your you know three years plus of experience with this? Uh, what what would you say are some of the you know, you know your top two or three things that you would recommend for for new users getting into Assemble would would um, be something you want them to look at? Yeah, I guess on our end, it's a making that relationship with the design team so they they understand that they can share the models. Obviously, that that's probably the biggest thing there, and then getting regular updates. So, you know, no matter if if they want to release it on every, you know, ASI or every design release, to say, hey, we want it weekly. You know, we know you're making changes. We know things are happening. We know there's things uh, that's hap You know, they're going on that you're just kind of testing out. But to continually have that information. And, and be able to constantly look at the change and look at what's happening, that's that's big for, for us at least. Awesome. I appreciate that. And I definitely want to echo both of those. I think if, if you guys uh, on the line have listened to uh, really any of the past webinars I've participated in, I, I love to kind of uh, always point back to the relationship that you have uh, between uh, the contractor and the designer and, the, and, and ultimately the owner as well, but, but specifically in this case uh, between design and construction. Um, fostering, building that relationship and maintain, you know, letting them know, providing transparency around what you're using the model for, why it's important to your business, um, what sort of information you're looking to glean out of the model or add into the model, um, and then m more frequently getting updates from them is, is really um, most typically not any extra work for anyone to do. It's just, it, it's again, it's, it's building that relationship and providing understanding about what, what the use is um, uh, downstream. So um, my, my other kind of, uh, I'll, I'll add one more myself. Um, with Assemble, I, I love to point to the interaction between how we filter data, how we group data, and how you can color code and kind of manage uh, uh, the properties of that. All of that is really dynamic, and um, if you guys are just diving into Assemble today, uh, certainly think about uh, the, the filtering you're doing based on properties and in terms of what you're grouping, uh, again, based on other properties and how you're color coding the model. Um, you can really look at those things in so many different ways. So, uh, you know, I, I, I love to interact with um, kind of different use cases and, and the ability to, you know, add data in and understanding uh, what, what the breakdown is of the model as you do that. So um, kind of take it from take it from Thomas, take it from me, that, that you know, build that relationship and, and really dive in. And, and, um, and, and I'll, I'll even add to that that, 
you know that relationship also matters in in understand and being able to teach the designers why you're doing it uh, and, and how you're trying to use it. So you might be able to convince them to maybe draw something a little bit different or add a little bit more data to it uh, than they might normally, you know, without really adding a whole lot more work on their end, just so that you can get a little bit more out of it, you know, for the owner's sake at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Thomas, I really appreciate um, both you coming on and, and talking about your use case, but also for to, to F.A. Wilhelm um, for, for allowing you to and supporting us in this. So really appreciate the time and really appreciate you getting the content together. I would just like to add a thank you to Thomas as well. Good job. Yeah, you're welcome. I know we are about almost there, so what I want to do is I do want to uh, allow you guys to actually spend some time, share some closing thoughts with all our attendees. I know we are about to start a brand new year. Any tips, any advice that you have for everyone who's joining us on how they can realize better project efficiency, better change management in the new year? So I'll start with you, Don. Any advice you have for our attendees? Yes, I always have advice. Uh, I think Samira, the <laughs> The most important thing for companies that are watching who may not have already done some of the things that Thomas has showed you today is that you get started. Uh, so you can do it on a project pilot. You could have uh, one person in an office do it. I think what you'll find, though, is that over time, this, uh, th this genre of software is getting much, much easier to use and much more friendly and it is being wielded by you know most of the you know major companies uh, throughout throughout North America, and it's growing in popularity overseas due to both government mandates and just you know smart business practices. So I guess my my tip for the new year is if you haven't gotten started yet, put some money aside and get started. Perfect. Thank you, Don. Thomas. Um, I guess I would say. You know, with any system like this, it's all about data uh, and information. And the more data you can get, and the more you can share it, uh, I think the better everybody is. So, you know, if you're able to get this out to teams and you're able to get it out to as many people as possible, I think everyone's better for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go. go ahead and jump in there and add on to that. The the more information you can share, the better. And 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 all you know the the that statement of the more data the better doesn't always uh, work whenever it's overwhelming or an overload but I think in the case that Thomas was mentioning um, this is really organization and structure around uh, enriched information that uh, adds a new lens um, so if, if you can have a conversation with your project team and um, while that conversation is taking place pull up a visual that represents exactly what you're talking about and and be able to point to the screen and say this this object here and how many more of that object are there and you then switch the view to say now let's go show all of this object of, across the whole project uh, th those interactions are fantastic so so driving the conversation with visuals uh, you know kind of to wrap up I I, I love to say uh, a picture paints a thousand words and, and a model can paint a thousand pictures so Thanks, Samira, for fielding all the questions for us and, and managing that process. And, and, and again, thanks, Thomas, for uh, participating today and sharing your, uh, your work.